Thank you, Tom. Thank you guys for coming out. Uh, I think it shows that it's good. And I truly believe in the owning your credit field. And that's what I'm going to try to show you guys today is how to connect blacksmithing and metal work to help out your shoeing. And it kind of all comes full circle, you know, one hand washes the other hand. So I'm just going to be repeating. I'm going to repeat a lot of things that you guys probably all been heard before. We're going to talk about like a half face blow. A half face blow compared to a full face blow or completely off of the anvil. And I know it's like pretty elementary, but we're talking about a half face blow, we're talking about the hammer hanging off of the anvil face. Or the anvil full off, full on. It seems like basic things, but the places where you hit them, the steel's going to react a lot easier just screwing things up to save them later, if that makes any sense. We'll go ahead and get started. I'm going to make a pair of hot fit tongs for you guys out of three, uh, three quarter by half. It's usually a stock that people have sitting around, so I thought it was not the ideal stock. But we kind of make it an ideal stock with serving things and hit them in the right spot. So the hot tongs, they have two different heads on them. One head is pretty square, it's going to hold the inside rim with the outside rim of the shoe. The other head is pointy, and it's going to hold the nail hole. Since one's pointy, it's going to grow more than the square head. So we're going to make mark two marks on the anvil face. One mark is going to be at 7 eighths, and one mark is going to be at 5 eighths. My 7 eighths mark is going to be for my flat side, it's going to hold on to the rim of the shoe. And my 5 8 mark is going to be for the pointy side that holds on to the nail hole part of my shoe. And when I come out, I'm going to do a half face blow like I was talking about. But I'm not going to just come up and hit straight on. If I hit straight on and not grab that edge, my edge is actually going to be compromised. I'm going to drip back on it. So I'm going to come down and really let it sink in there and then start catching up with my hand. It's just like if you're going to go split some wood, you're not going to split wood with a sledgehammer because it's not breaking down the molecules. So I'm going to go after it a little bit where I can chunk that thing and make it easier on myself. Get on. This first part, is, you can always overdo it. And so I'm not going to use the striker for the first part. It's not something that needs a lot of band handling. So I'm going to, I can always go back and set more. If anybody's ever tried to make some tongs, it usually comes out that they're going to be like paper or they're holding something like inch. Because either you didn't do enough or you did way too much. It's a really hot part to get a half a medium in there. So I believe in the saying that if it feels good and it's easy, don't do it too much. Because it's probably like you're doing way too much damage than you are good. Those hard hits, no one ever wants to do them too much because it's not enjoyable. But I like flattening out a shoe. Everybody always wants you to just go to town and flatten the shoe out because it's the easy thing to do and you're not going to look like an idiot. But it, like making a heel, people will watch people check out kind of early in a competition because they're getting nervous and it's a hard hit. But really that's probably a spot they should be camping out at. Both of them are the same size, so it doesn't matter which one's which right now. But I'm going to come out, like I said, give it that dip. Now I'm going to start catching my hand back. Now once I'm here, I'm kind of already flat now, and I don't want to lose any more material here, because that's a weak spot in tongs always. So I'm going to start going towards myself. When I'm coming through, I'm not doing a lot with my arm or with my wrist. I'm doing it with my elbow and my shoulder. So when I start coming down, right when I'm here, I'm going to tighten my ab and pull my elbow into myself, and the steel is going to follow my hammer because that's where I'm directing it. Steel wants to go to the path of least resistance. And so right now, the path of the re least resistance is right there at that mark. So if I can pull back to myself, I can build myself a nice little ridge. I'm going to gather my material back up, being mindful that I don't want to do too much. I'm just kind of collecting the damage. Now I kind of always, when I'm making my tongs, will have a little bit in already because 
it's inevitable that it's going to keep on drifting out on me as I do later things in life. And so I want to just get ahead of the game and get it out there right now. So once I get a shape that I'm pretty happy with, I'm going to confirm that shape by running my edges. That contains everything up. So now I'm not going to lose it. And my, it looks like a clean section. Now I'm bumpy and bumpy sharp edges on there. So that was the flat side that's going to hold on the outside grip of the shoe or the inside grip of the shoe. Now I'm going to go to my 5 8 part. Get my set down, start picking up, start coming in myself. Now this one's going to be pointy, and so I'm going to come in myself here too. Always build back to myself so I have a strong pair of tongs. And also, I don't want it to get too long on and so if I just went at it and just kind of real fly handed and let the nose of my hammer go out too, well I'm going to squirt things out. But if I start at the end and pull towards myself, it's going to come back to me. I try to be mindful of how many times I hit things, so then I kind of Stay correct, as you say, and I forge you square. Because no matter what, these have bad habits of humans. And whenever you're learning to do something new, you're constantly trying to correct these bad habits that we have. We're all real right handed, we're all real left handed, and so you have to just kind of overcome, know where you suck, and try not to do it. So I got everything kind of forged down. I got my edges ran. I'm pretty happy with it. I might have to do a little bit of work a little more, but I think it's in the ballpark, so I don't want to go too far right now. It's something, because I still, next step I'm going to come out and I'm going to half face this, and I'm going to squish it out for my boss. I'm going to start thinning that area. So that's going to, that leg is going to grow a lot. So I don't want to get too confirmed here until I get that section kind of ran up. So I'm going to come out and set it over. So tongs are just a pair. It doesn't matter which way you turn things, you just have to turn things all the same. So you just need to be diligent in where you're at. And you want to kind of put this at a 45 just so you have a gusset here. Because it's coming back and it's going to be strong. That's where we already know that things are going to be weak there possibly. So we want to kind of stay strong there. So I'm half facing. Things aren't flat, right? Because if so, they run away from me. I'm trying to really dig in. I just slowly start to drop my hand. Now I know just from doing this that I have a bad habit of making this side thin and this side thin. So the whole entire time I'm swinging on that thing, I'm really trying to concentrate on dropping my elbow and keeping my arm laying really flat. And like, it would have been quicker work right to use a striker, but the striker can't pull on this edge. He's coming from a different direction with the hammer, so he's always going to be pulling my work away from me. So it's just not a good time to have him hit it. Now that I got that section out, we'll flip it around and deal with the rain. Doing the same thing again, make sure I turn the same way. I got my edge in the same place. Start dropping the hammer. I'll kind of square this back up. This is the full out. See, already right there, you can see how much that jaw started opening up on me already. That's kind of why we were already there. <coughs> I'm going to come in and refix it. So I'm still ahead of the game. But it's really, it's kind of like a horseshoe. It's really easy to pull out. You don't want it, but you kind of push it all the way back in if you need to get up reckless and stuff. So now I'm going to kind of just fix out the rest of my section. I got the front kind of situated out, and I'm going to come back and we're going to thin out the back half of it. And then we're going to kind of run up the reins a little bit just to get them up started. When I'm going to, when I'm going to thin them out, 
I want to kind of offset that boss area to the reins already. Just to kind of get inertia and everything lined up going that way. And so we're going to come out and half face on the, the horn. Andrew's going to kind of favor his side. So it kind of sucks the boss and everything over there for me. And then we kind of have a place to start from. So it doesn't wholly matter where this car's going to be. But it doesn't want to be too far up that way. I think kind of kicking this way already, right? The reason I flipped it around so that it's hot on the right side is so I'm not doing a lot of damage to all that stuff I just did. If I would have got hot the other way, that jaw would go, go with it. And it always, no matter which way you go, it just wants to follow the hammer. It's going to come right back at it because that's where inertia is coming from. Right. So when I go to draw a pedal, there's two different ways I kind of look at it. If I'm by myself a lot, I'll use the edge of the anvil and I'll do half face blows. And so pretty much what I'm trying to do is make an accordion, and then I'm going to stretch that accordion out. And so I'm not wholly forging metal as much as I am bouldering metal. And like it's just a, a real, in blacksmith terms, it's a pretty sharp fold. In our terms, it's a pretty dull fold. So that's it. All of these tools are just more, like once you start getting on edge with them, they are a folder, so you can use the flat side of your face as a folder when you're flattening things out. You don't have to just keep hitting flat. You can kind of dig with the heel of your hammer and punish things out and get them chunked out a little bit just to break up the molecules and the steel. It gets to a point where everything gets so packed up, it can't just release, release. So if you come back from an edge or a folder, it kind of breaks it apart again a little bit easier, and so you're not just packing things up nonstop. Since I got a striker, we're going to use the horn because it's easier for a striker to go on the horn than it is here. On the horn, he's forging straight down. If I am on the edge of the anvil, he's continually pulling it towards himself and kind of pulling it out of my hands. A good striker is pretty valuable, right? Because he's got to be kind of a guy that's he's thinking about making the tool as much as you're thinking about making the tool. He's not just dummy in a long swing at the hammer. I try really hard with my tongs to stay very level, to, to just stay with him so I'm not, if I come down like this, he's going to jump back at him like this and things are going to get uneven and now we're just bending, we're not forging and we're not getting things done. So I try to stay diligent, just the same as making shoes or anything else, having a very sturdy but light tong hand. I'm not pushing down on things really bad because that would be the same as bending it up, so I'm not trying to force it onto the horn as much as I'm just trying to float along with it. I'll get this one. Maybe. Yeah. So if I'm by myself though, I'm going to use the edge of the handle. And I'm just going to turn. Just keep walking up the steps.
Now come back. Go to the points. Like, I came okay with things looking ugly for a while. You guys kind of trust in the process of things are going to come out and the only thing you can really do here is you go too far. And so I don't want to be too aggressive and kind of beat things up too much or then I have a big kick somewhere, you know what I mean? So now that I've gone through the shark bowl by myself, I'll come over to the door and roller and kind of pick things up. Now a quick flat, filling all the gaps. I know that seems like a weird thing that those gaps can be filled, but if you watch a body shop guy, they have things called shrinkers. They'll grab on a metal and pull it together. So when our hammer hits two mounts, I, I think there's a little bit of that happening, where it's pulling it inside of there, where it can't get past the hammer, or the mounts that were there, and so it goes ahead and fills the gaps a little bit. All right, we're going to pick another run on this one. Yep. Get out of here. Get out of here. So I, I think the best way to describe this almost is that I'm rolling out a tube of toothpaste. You know, you're just grabbing it one end and squeezing it on and out. You can kind of do anything you want on top of it. Not anything you want, but you can have a round tom grain, or you can have kind of an oval tom grain. The, there's benefits to both, I think. Oval tom grains, you can have a little bit lighter berry tongs to see, and they kind of have a gusset, so they're a little bit stronger. Round tom grains, you, guy, you get, feel like you get bit a lot, then the round tom grains are going to be a little bit nicer for you, but it's going to be a little more weight in your hand, and they don't have as much strength. They're a little more bendy because they don't have a gusset going one direction. Now that I've got to a square, I don't, I like having an oval ring, but no matter what, I'm going to go to a square because that's what they forge as well. If you're at a rectangle, you got to get it kind of to a square before it starts really going somewhere. Now that I'm going to square on it, I'll go to an octagon next. And then I'll go to that six-sided thing I can't pronounce, or a 16-sided thing. And then we'll round things up. See, I kind of kind of screwed the pooch there. I went to lift it on my arm, and things got nasty. They didn't stay nice and square, and we didn't keep drawing. Got to the square again here. Now if things, if things went too quickly, I'm pretty happy with where they are right now, but if, like, if, if you just have to go too quickly and you didn't want your tongue rings to get much smaller, you'd probably want to take the edges off of it now. 
because this is the stage of the temperature that is not going to grow a lot. The hotter things are, the more they're going to move. So at this point, this color, it's more of a packing heat. But I, I want to get a little bit more growth out of them, so I'm going to go ahead and run into some heat. Like this one. We established that little sweep, so I have some to go from. Now I'll my edges up. When I run those edges, you want to get one and squish it. So if you have a square, I ran these ones, now I put this way. So I want to come back to these ones, so now I get back to where I was. I think that's kind of one of the hard things about forging sometimes, is just remember where you were just a second ago. You know, you're kind of get tired. You're not really sure what you just did, so you go into something else. Now you might have even more work because you got to play a little bit of catch up. Intentional. It kind of speaks for the craftsmanship of the whole deal. So 
son. What I try to do, that's a right there. What I try to do is imagine a ribbon. So I try to imagine a ribbon on there. I don't think there's a measurement for every single one. Somebody might have a measurement out there. But for me, it's all about proportions. And so I, if the proportions are right, the top will look right, or any, whatever we're building. And so I just want to imagine a ribbon on there, and then kind of imagine where my shoulder's going to go into it. Top with long bosses don't look that good. They kind of look like things didn't go real right. Tom, the too short of a boss aren't going to be good because you're not going to have a good amount of strength around the rear hole and again, things are just going to look kind of small. So once I imagine where it's going to be, I'll draw a line for both of them. I'll come to my a sharp ample edge and give myself a notch so that I can find it when it's hot. Go ahead and throw those in. When I come out, I'm going to come out, hopefully not drop it. I'm going to come out, spin them around, I'm going to hold it from the jaw. I'm going to set that notch off of the edge of the ample. And I'm going to come out and fully off of the ample, drive my round side into the back. So it's going to kind of start kicking inertia the right way for a pair of tires. And what it also is doing is giving me a ledge to get my cross speed in there by myself. I, I don't have very many people that come over to my shop to help me, so I really had to figure out how to do things alone. And I had a little bit of epiphany. Alice Johnson has some videos out of Jay Sharp, the 88, making some tongs. So he was kind of already up there, and he probably knew some stuff at that point. He kind of knew some shortcuts. And I watched him do that off the page of the ample. It kind of blew my mind. And I knew every kind of did a tongue clinic after that. People's tongue became a lot more consistent, and it was just a lot easier to get things going because that's the problem you kind of run into when making a pair of tongs. It's just like a never ending story of not enough offset. That these are always touching right here. And once they touch right there, you're done. It doesn't matter, like, once that stock's there, if you're making a pair of shoes, and you, they start out as half inch tongs, and you kind of set it down a little bit, and you got a little more up to the flatter. Well, now you need a little bit more give on those tongs. And once they touch right there, the give's gone. Now you're just bending the reins and the jaws aren't moving anymore at all. So you got to stay, it creates another fulcrum. You want the rivet to be the only fulcrum. So that really gets it kicked over there. And it's it's going to get, like, it's going to screw stuff up when I first do it. That whole rain's going to come at me because it has a lot of bass out there. And it's going to want to come to the hammer. So I don't want to do much. But it does give you a good little set down. Now I got a nice shelf. I can come in, straighten up the back. You can make it tongs. You gotta let them die by the straight back of the rings. Once they get a curve there, it's not gonna come together real great. They need to be straight to that point. And that needs to be a tight radius, very acute bend. If it's a long, lofty bend, well then it's gonna come in and touch each other because they don't really have a choice.
What's that? A good amount. Like I, I, it's rarely that you're gonna come to a point like, like, man, I did way too much offset there. And it's like someone coming like, dude, you built way too big a coffin on your roadster. It doesn't really happen. And yet that is the hard part, you can't get over there. So I think you kind of be pretty generous at that point. You just don't want to get forging too much and get things thinned out. So right there at that point, you kind of max out the capabilities of that part of the amp and that part. You need to do the rest of it all. Now I come in with my cross paint. A big mistake is people want to get too high up on the horn. It needs to be in a cute bend, so you need to be up in here. These first blows, I'm just kind of establishing to get that cross paint to the bottom of that notch and get it forged out a little bit. Now that I got it like pretty forged, I don't want to get any thick. I'm trying to clean up my bosses. At the same time, when I clean up that boss, I'm hitting from this side and not this side. If I hit from this side, that jaw's going to come empty. If I hit from this side, the jaw's probably going to stay pretty well where it is. This is when you're going to know how much offset you kind of need. Once you get it out here, you're going to want the middle of that rivet to come down the back of the rain. Because if you're over into the rain, well then obviously you're going to be sitting on top of each other. But if you're coming out and you're down the middle of the back, you're going to be in a nice spot. Let my cross beam find the bottom of that notch. Kind of gather my boss. Like right now, I just saw when I did that that I kind of hit back here too much, and now my I kind of moved my offset. Over. So I need to come back to the horn. And now, if I have to saw it up against the horn, it's just like shaving a shoe. I can forge it. So I need to create an air gap back there, so it actually fits. I got it back. I'm really kind of a slow forger. I, I like things to be nice before I move on. So then my next step's even easier, I think. So I, like I probably could be done there, but it's not going to be real sweet. And so I'm going to go ahead and take one more heat on each one of them, just to clean things up a little bit. A little more offset would have hurt on these here. So again, I'll create the air gap. I'll fill that air gap in. I'm back into myself a little bit here. Now that I got that, that shoulder established, I can put that shoulder on up to it. And I want to be equal with things, because I think that everything's kind of in a straight path. So I want to come from the back side too. Because when I work from here, the jaw comes up. When I work from here, the jaw comes up. If I want to be equal to where I am, I take my edges, take my edges. Whenever I'm trying to make things nice, I try to make sure that my hammer handle and my work are kind of on the same line. So that eliminates a lot of my bad habits in the human. I don't, I don't control the hammer a lot this way, you know? So it can kind of find itself a nice flat here. 
But I always want to kind of forget myself a lot of times because I can see the heel of the hammer. And so I can kind of see where it's digging and get a flat base from that. If I was to work up, I'm blind because I can't see the tone of the hammer. And so I can just be digging all the way up and you really can't control it. Like you can get okay at it, but it's never going to be great. Up the next one a little more. Like my jaws, kind of, everything's kind of reset me a little bit. So before I have a hold of everything, it's a good time just to get a kick back down the square. I'm going to come out next, we're going to put a hole in for our ribbon. So the same thing, I just try to imagine a straight line coming down this thing, and a straight line down the middle of it. So you got a little bit of a crosshair, but where everything's gonna line up. Now that I got that crosshair, I'm coming and pit my, and since it's past my spindle, if I just put a center mark there, I'm going to cover up the stud punch. The stud punch is about 5 sixteenths at the bottom, and so I could be off pretty much 5 sixteenths all the way around it. I don't really know. But if I have a crosshair with the soapstone, I can see if I'm in the middle of it all the way around. This one needed a little bit of catch up, I noticed. I noticed this, this jaw wasn't quite long enough. But it's kind of an alright deal because we have a few in there. We didn't go too far. I want, they already look kind of good with thickness, and so I want to stay off. I want to keep the heel of my hammer still on the face. I don't want to come off the ample. Because once I come off the ample, then I'm starting to push the jaw down and I'm getting more of a thickness in between my jaws. I want to stay in it. Rub my edges. Kind of a handy little thing with hot bit tongs and having a little bit of a, of a tooth to grab like a concave edge or something. So I'm just going to drop my hand slightly and kind of just put that little bite. I want to clean up the edges there. Push that dot in. Now I'll drop across there. It, it's kind of just a handy thing. If you set your hand on the anvil, everything gets really hot. But if you kind of pin your hand on your hammer, get it close, you have a little bit of a heat barrier. So you get up above things, spend a little more time, and not try to just get out of there real quick. That's hot. <laughs> that was a good one. 
Okay. I'll use you. So, we got like that eat up inside the idiot drop in the bucket. But, when I'm using the stud hole, and then if there are any punches under the sledgehammer, you want to think about them. things are coming from a different area now. When we're coming by ourselves, everything's coming at us. So, like, when I'm punching, a, even a four punch, I kind of know that I'm going to be bad. I'm going to push this thing around wherever I want to go. So, I'm going to be preventative about it. I didn't really think about this until I started using power hammers and presses. And everybody has, everybody's hammer and press has a little bit of a hitch in the giddy up. I mean, it could be a brand new beast and the dies are kind of slightly off this way or like a little giant. They seem like they're coming straight up and down, right? But they got a swing on the top. And so that whole entire die's got a little bit of a shimmy at the end. So when you're punching something underneath it, you kind of got to go preventative on the shimmy. So it pulls things straight. I'm going to do the same thing when Andrew drops a sledgehammer that I'm going to get a little preventative to it and lean it towards me because I know he's going to pull it straight when he hits it. Even though he's a good striker and he got good hammer control, he can't help me. He's a human. That's just the way his arms go. And so we kind of all work together with no one's bad. And everything can come out good. I know I'm not that good at making a round object. Craig was talking about earlier this thing, a circle is the hardest thing to get. Everybody thinks they know what it is, but it's really hard to get a nice circle. And so I, that's why I move my stud punch around, because it's kind of correcting itself as it is. But I got to go ahead and flatten at that point. It, I think it washes my mark out. My mark gets kind of big. So I go ahead and leave it up. I think I have a nice shiny mark. We can drop things out really quickly. Yep. I want to keep things moved up so I'm not getting stuck on anything. Like. Like. Just make sure everything's nice and round. Be tight, and Andrew knows what's going on here, so he's not just gonna kill it. Because if, if he just wanted to be real courageous and go ahead and hit it, well, we might ruin the project. I'm gonna go ahead and pack the both sides of this thing because I want both sides to be real flat. And I, when I punched that hole, I created a mountain and a valley, and so I always kind of want to put the valley on the inside of the top. Because if you have, or the mountain on the inside of the tunnel, if you have two valleys, this is going to be a cup. That's when tunnels don't operate real well. But if things are on two mountain tops, they don't have a lot of resistance and they can work really well around the fulcrum. If you took a pair of uh, GE tunnels apart or something, they all have a machine ridge around the rivet hole. And that's why everything's right on just those. And it's not going to get real bound up on anything. It's got room to clean it out. This is a hard hit because I'm pretty likely to hit the dog. So I'm just going to spin it around where I can see the jaw, I can see the heel, I can see the heel of my hammer. And I got to suck right up in there. And you can see right now, there's a shiny spot on the inside of that moss where it's going to ride on each other. That's what I think is pretty cool about forging is like, coincidentally all these things work out. You know, it seems pretty interesting to me that everything kind of goes with each other as long as you kind of follow the steps. Put a hole in the next one. Like I went ahead and take the opportunity to grease up the tool while we're going to be doing some work. Because I don't want to grease and then come to put the stop on. You're going to be all squirrely all over the place because the tool's all slick. Yep. And, and the striker can feel it right away. Like they, you kind of know when things are going right because it just falls. Come back. 
Fighting up again. Come around by the seat things. Now we kind of have a base of the tongues worked out. It's, it gets hard describing tongues. People when you're making them for a demo or something because there's, there's a lot of offsets. Like you kind of throw that, it seems like you say the word all the time when you're making tongues to somebody. But we got this offset done, the shoulder offset. Now we're gonna make the boss and rain offset. So what it's gonna do is gonna stack the rings for us. Uh, blacksmiths, you, you see their tongues, they won't usually do that. And I, I I really don't know where it came from, you really? So they get lined up together? Yeah. But I I like when they line up on top of each other. I have some tongs, like blacksmith tongs, that they lay on top of each other and they're twisting your hand on top and everything. Where if they're lined up on top of each other, it's a really nice thing. But it's kind of, you need to be conscious at this point where everything's nice and flat and easy to fix, that everything is square. Because if that jaw is a little bit off, it's not as big of a deal on a pair of hot fit tongs as it is on a pair of shoemaker tongs. If you have a pair of shoemaker tongs and the jaw's crooked to the rings, then you don't go square. You're kind of always relying on just looking at your stock. But if everything's square on the jaws, your hand will square really well. Like it, it can just feel it. You just have to kind of trust yourself on the gut of it. But if you go to trusting your gut, and you got a pair of tongs that are a little twisted, well, you're gonna start to stop trusting your gut really quickly. So everything's, everything's pretty lined up on these right now. I don't have to worry, but if, if I did, it was a little off. You can either have the choice of throwing it in the vise when it's hot, and just twisting the jaw back to place. Right, it's a pretty quick thing. If you don't have a vise, you come in, and set the boss on the face and set the high spot up. Like, so it's kind of floating. And you got a fulcrum over here and a fulcrum right here. And so you can just hit down and it'll pull the jaw right back into place for you. It'll kind of put a dinger on something, but it happens pretty quick and you don't have to have a vice to do it. So if you got a nail on the board, you can still get it done and get it fixed. Now that we got the hole in it, We're going to make that offset like I was talking about to get the rain stacked up. It's kind of nice when you hold it like, at this point my tongs I like to make them out of coke because I'm just getting the front half off so it means I'm not doing any damage to the back half. But I'm wanting to make a pocket for this all to sit in. So this is the upside, I need another upside. So that means I have to push down. So anytime I'm going to go to do this offset, my jaw is going to stay facing up at me. And it just looks good. And it gives you clearance for the next tongue if everything's at this, the same angle. So I'm going to line my point up. I get, I'm going to put a parallel there and the parallel of the ample face. Set a cross beam up there and let them hit it. Now, people will shear their things off at this point a lot because they get too much up on the ample. And that's when you're doing like a half base blow pretty much with the cross beam and you're forging. I just want to be venting as much as possible. So I'm going to be off of the ample. It's not a lot because you got to think these tongs, they're quarter inch thick about. And so it only needs to be like 3 16 to an eighth of an inch to be able to stack on top of each other. It just has to be half of the distance. It's so just with inertia, things happen. When he hits it here, it goes up here. Comes to come back. And when he does that, it puts a whip inside this box. So I'm going to hit that jaw, get that whip going. Have him hit it again, it'll bring the whip flat. If I still have any, I come to a corner, you know, and do a little flattening. Or sometimes, you can, if you have a big bow in it, you can set it on the rain with your pocket and off of the ankle completely and just kind of lightly tap it and we'll take that out of there, right? Right now I got a little bit of this going on. And so I can still easily come back to the ammo face and just tap it with my phosphate. It'll you know, bring everything back in portions for me and back in the line.
Thank you, sir. All right, same thing. We're gonna have that jaw sticking up there. I'm gonna make sure my parallel is right. Hang that cross all the way off there. Something to be mindful is make sure the cross beam's the same this way as that way. So if it's not level with the angle face this way, then it's not gonna set that boss down right. Right? If I have a dip of this too much, it's gonna do that. If it's that way too much, it's gonna do this. If they're not gonna ride together, the rings aren't gonna be square together. Kind of flat this back out, kick my jaw out. Make sure everything's nice and flat. And at this point, I wanna make sure that that jaw is flat from the back side of the rings. And so I, I never had to do too much of this and regather them because I kind of established in the beginning because I'm preventative about it. It's the same thing like you're hemming up a shoe or something. You don't want to be chasing your tail the whole entire time. You're bored. You want to be preventative about it early on into it where the steel's set up to be hemmed. Once it's fuller, it's got a hole in it. And now you're just filling that hole and opening the hole back and forth. You're just hoping you're going to kind of lose some material in the process. And it, it kind of work, but it doesn't work that great. Where if you hem up the shoe beforehand, this, the shoe has strength to it. And so you are actually forging that in, and then all you're doing is rolling it back out and it comes sweet. Think, think, I'm pretty happy with the top half of this thing. But I'm gonna go in, I'm just gonna clean my reins up one more time. Now that everything's done up here, I can come from it. I'm going to do a quick cleanup on this one. But this is the one that I didn't use as much as the jaw, since it was the pointy end. So this one has a little bit longer range. Hot fit tongue, kind of nice to have a lock on. Or pretty much like, I don't think a lock on a pair of hot fit tongue should be like real tight. I think it's kind of something just to keep the tongs on there when you set the shoe down on the floor. You know, I don't mind having to re squeeze the tongs when I go to burn on. But it's really annoying to have keep falling over when you set your shoe on the ground. That's all like my hope is with a lock is to keep them together, keep them upright. So I come over to my other ring and kind of see where my comparison is going to be. And I got I got probably a half inch more on this one than I have on that one. So I know I can bend up about a half an inch and my rings are going to come to you still. Do a little 
little rascal on this one. The same thing when I rasp that when I forge, I try to take chunks out first. I, I don't want to be camped out for too long or do the hard work that I need to do. So even if I'm rasping or grinding, uh, I, I go edge to edge and I eat. I don't just go flat to it. So I want to make my edges smooth so I'm going to come right to it. Take that little one. That's it. Go to my skin. Same thing, I try to be mindful of bad hot habits of just being humans and for some reason we get a handle on this and so everybody looks to push a rasp. When you push a rasp, it just bobs up. So you'll see people are going rasp up and up. The end is always big, you know what I mean? Because they're over here digging. So you need to kind of be mindful that it's a pulling tool. You know, it's like a saw. It's only going to cut one direction, so try not to work against yourself, try to work for yourself, and keep your tool sharp and get done with it. I got the reins pretty cleaned up. I'm gonna go ahead and clean my boss area up a little bit. You can tell I don't have all these fancy vices. <laughs> I'll kind of quench this off so I isolate where my work's gonna be done at. I want to go back towards myself, right? I need to bend it towards the back of the pump. I know everybody in this block is like, man, he only said a half an inch, but he bent up a lot. So I knew I was going to lose it right there. Now once I kind of got everything in the same field, I kind of draw it up. I used to think I heard the very first salary that there was a lot of no no's you didn't want to do it. You didn't want to look like an idiot at the anvil or something. And so you just try to be really rigid, you know, in everything that you're doing. Like it's okay to be creative with how you speak. Like you see a lot of people they, they'll dig at this egg because they never want to let that thing go past them. It's pretty hard unless you get over the top of the anvil and come around, or you let that hammer hand just pass your hand on. So you gotta get your thumb out of the way and let your hand kind of roll over so it can come back around to itself if you're down in a hinge. Or if you're trying to stay tight and lift over, your elbow and your shoulder are probably going to start hurting since your wrist. But you can be a little loose with things and let the hammer carry you around. It can get a lot of work done. So I got my little tab there. I'm going to kind of just draw it out and get it thin so it's springy. It's just going to be kind of a friction piece. And so once I get it a little springy, I'll put some divots in it. And I know from just making comedy before, like it's like anything you got a little experience that this is the problem area, you know, so you kind of want to get some material out of the way there. And not only like, you're not know, just like grasping it away, but you're just easing that edge so that the edges aren't catching each other. If you got two sharp edges, they're going to run into each other pretty good. So if you just save it up a little bit so things can pass each other, you'll have feel a little ahead. I got a to a call for the road.
And I know another problem that you all run into, and I, 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 I've run into it with these tongs, I didn't do a good job of pulling it back onto the amp face enough on it to go set down that jaw to create the boss area. So I got a little bit of material up in there that the jaws would hit on the inside of the jaws, the boss would touch each other. So I'm just gonna come in, take some away right there. Make sure that boss is flat. So I want to stay with the pocket thing. So I'm going to set down this side so everything coming up is coming up. Keep real snapping. Do some gathering. Now that I'm kind of with the inches I want, I'll clean up my edges. Come together, they'll sit those little notches, right? There'll be a little bit of friction here. I've already established my lines from the other side where I can see a lot. So this side, I'm kind of just cleaning back up two lines that I put on the back side. I'm not really trying to change anything. This side's pretty much ready to go together. The reason I like to get this side done first, like I could have started a little early on that one, you know, the way to put this one in, but it's nice to have a reference. So like if you're building more shoes, you have one branch done, now you're going for a cleanup key, you got branches of reference to each other. So you're not just like out in the open trying to make things up. You have something to go off of. You know, it's like when you're making shoes in the shop. You don't have feet to go off of, so it's kind of a hard thing to tell if it's a great shoe. But then you go to the foot, you got a reference or something to complement it. We got a side to complement the other side now, and so we can kind of get a direction. All right, so I'm just going to come up and snug up to that mark. It's just where I set it down. I'm going to put them right on top of each other. And the end one, the end one's not going to be one that's going to grab anything. It's just so they can get on there. Because you got a big old blocky end where you can't really get it up on top of the thing. It's not a slip of slope. I like to put a little bit of a 
a, a tab there. So it's like going the, that direction already, so it gets out of the way of the other ramp. And the other rain has a ramp to run up to come into the locks. So, good brush. Now that I have both sides kind of roughed out, and I got one side copy, I'm going to check it to see if I need to go anywhere before I start rasping up the other side. And like right off the bat, I know that I need to move by a good rule of keeping the back flat. I'm going to come to the picture. Line up my tongue hole, my rivet holes, and see where I'm stacked up. And so, once I'm riveted, things you really can't change is get gap in between those those reins right there. I want it so I'm, I'm happy that there's a gap there. I know I got a little bit of clearance issues here, but like I said, I already knew that it was there. So I can double check that on the, the RAS one and know that I'm gonna be good on that clearance issue, that's not gonna be a problem. I just need to do the same thing on the other one and I'll be in the, in the good. I know that my little lock mechanism down here is all right. I had like three of them sitting around there. I'm gonna rasp this one up real quick. Put them together. Keep my edges all first. This came out pretty clean, so there's really not a lot of work to be done there, I don't think. So I'm going to go ahead and just go to my job. So I know I have that clearance issue there. I'm going to go ahead and address that now. Have a little bit of a mass to it, so it can soak some stuff up.
got rid of that. It. Done. Sweet. Show all the one. Alright, so I'm pretty lined up. Everything's pretty clean. I still I still got a little bit of a clearance issue there. Like it'd be alright, but it wouldn't be would be real nice. I'm a little bit picky about before I put things together because kind of you like you hit the point of no return. You can't come back and see the in it. So it's just nice to get everything right the first time. If you didn't check this when it's hot, it's kind of, it would have been a better time to check it. But also I need to open up my hole a little bit. That's not the end of the world. Oh, they get another one. That was the That was it. <laughs> I just want to go somewhere that I'm not going to get too screwed up here. Now I know I can go back this way and I'm going to flatten it back out, but I just did. Just didn't step much. Alright, so we got a pretty good hole wall there right now. If I get big enough, that's, but it's not round enough. So obviously my punch has got a little bit of weird stuff going on. Make sure everything's kind of where you want it to be. 
before you get too committed. Something to think about. I didn't find this out because I went through a little bit of a time where I was maybe a little over the age or something, and I decided I was going to make all my own rivets for my tongue because I thought being really smart that, well, the tongue made out of 40 by 40, so I should probably put 40 by 40 rivets in there and so everything was wearing the same. But then you kind of think about the tongue are the valuable part, not the rivet. The rivet is a very cheap part, it's a very easy part to put another one in it. And so if I have when I was putting the 4140 rivets in, the hair eating the tongs up as much as the tongs were eating the rivet up. So it was like too much of an equal game. The rivet is the weak link when it's a mild steel. So you just kind of move the rivet, pop it out, put it in, the tongs will feel good. But what I figured out was I was making that rivet to go inside my rivet block, it needed to be cold because things expand when they get hot. You know, you're messing with your side precision items, like very close holes. They, that little bit matters. And so, just with like, once the rivet gets hot or something like that, it gets a little bit bigger, now your holes aren't gonna match up. So it's something to kind of keep in mind. <coughs> so I say that, it's gonna be just whipped hot, not hot. So when I get it cold, it's gonna shrink back on. We're just gonna lightly, up. And like, it, it's something that you gotta think about when you make shoes too, because your nail holes are gonna fit kind of nice, and you're gonna push that shoe off, now all your nail holes are shrunk. And so you got a little bit of stickiness to them. And so it's, you wanna kind of make sure that maybe you set like, got a little bit of room there, so that when everything shrinks up, they're gonna fit real, real nice. You gotta brush. It's been like, we got a good even though like, my hole is perfectly round. The rib is perfectly round because it came from machinist. It was a fourth tough name. But I know I can get it in there. We're going to just do the same thing, open that hole up. Andrew's not hitting it hard enough, like, he's not killing it. And so all we're doing is just kind of getting it open. We're not really doing a lot of damage. Make sure it's kind of flat again. No, you're going to put a push a little flash on there. You're going to come back again for life. That was a better hole. So automatically, tongs, just one side ends up riveting, and one walking, one side ends up three. And so I'm sure you guys have heard that term a couple times. What it means is, like, this side right here is a free side. The rivet doesn't spin on it. It's just moving around that rivet. Does that make sense? And so on this tongs, I already have one side that's a little loose hole, and I got one side of the hole that's tight. And so, I don't put a locking mechanism in my tongue. A lot of guys would have notch it or something there, so they have something to fill it to, so it really locks in there. I learned how to make tongs from Shane Carter first, and he didn't teach how to lock them, so I just never locked them, and I haven't had bad luck with it so far, so I just keep going with what I know. And so I'm gonna go with the loose hole, 
is going to be the side my pant head is going to go on. The tight one is going to be my lock side. And so that's the side I'm going to bring it in. That's the side I'm going to push it down. Check this hole, see if that glitch got us small. Good. Just gonna make sure that I'm kind of on top of it. Right there. Now I got it inside of there. Kind of see that everything's gonna be all right. I'm just gonna give it a little squeeze. So then it won't fall out on me. Like it wasn't a great potential lot. You know what I mean? Because that side is tight, but it's a good idea. So the best thing to use with these, like to rip it with, is a torch is number one. You can set a torch here, and I can get a rip, just the end of the rip hot that I'm going to get hot. I'm not doing any other potential damage to nothing else. The next best is going to be a coke fire. We like to just lay it down, and part of the rivet is going to sit inside of my fire, and so that's the only thing to be hot, the hottest, and so it's not going to screw anything up. The least effective is a gas fire, because it's just nothing but radiant heat, and so the whole entire thing's hot. The only thing that's kind of going for it that's good is the rivet sticking up. And so I want to put that up in the forge so it's potentially hopefully getting hotter the fastest, but I need to be mindful that everything's hot. And so I can't just go ahead and rivet and then start ripping them apart because I'm just going to ruin everything in my shoulders. So I need to kind of quench up to those shoulders when I first start so I can be preventative enough and then wait for them to cool enough that it's not real windy and hot and just going to go everywhere on me. What else is important when you're going to rivet? Anybody that's trying to set some rivets knows it's one of those things that you think is going to be really easy and it goes downhill in a hurry. Like with the first couple hits, it's kind of like making a caulking that you just got to start the journey and see where it's going to go. But it's a good idea to be a little bit prepared for the journey and set yourself up for that. So the first hit I come out, I'm going to give that rivet my elbow. I'm just going to let my arm have at it so it's going to push that rivet away from me. So it's going to prevent my bad habits to for the rest of the push down the rivet where I start bringing it at me. Now I don't want to get too past that rivet. If I come up and push over here too far, well now I just brought it at me again. I need to come up and make sure that I dig a little bit with the front and actually push it away. I'd probably let those get a little hot yakking, but We're going to be alright. Alright, so I'm going to come out, make sure everything's kind of flat. And then I'm going to push. And now I start coming down at it. Everything went alright. And when I'm this, when I'm flat to be my reins, you can feel the reins in your hand and believe that they're not level. You always want to hit the whole rein in your hand. So if I'm here and I feel this length grow, this rain is low, I'm gonna go ahead and hit it here because that's the mountain top. Now I'm gonna bring it back to me. Now the stuff's kind of starting to cool down, make sure my jaws are kind of all lined out with each other. And then I'm straight coming through here. But now I can start opening things because the heat's just right there. Like, something that I did a lot was I forget to close them all the way. And so you kind of get done with the rain, you think you got a good pair of dogs going, and then later you go back to them, you got you got an inch, you know, that they won't go all the way down. So never get your fingers out of the way, get them all the way closed, and open them up as far as you can. So I came out with a good spot on these, I think. Because when you read, we're going to fit these up now. And when you fit reins or fit tongs up, it's really hard to go down sizes. So if you've got a pair of tongs that were half inch, now they're kind of big, you're thinking like, why do you three eighths tongs? You're kind of dreaming and you're going to probably wreck some stuff. It's not going to come out with the rain. You're going to have a gap in the back of the jaws pretty much always. You're either going to do that or you're going to ruin the ribbon side of it. So it's really easy to size up. 
So if I'm making tall for my house and just making some, they pretty much all come out the same size that they're going to fit. And that's usually about quarter inch because that's the smallest that I'm going to have to do to shoot inside this. So if I come out a quarter inch, I can always size up. I can size up to about half inch and stretch it a little bit. After that point, you need to have a little bit of planning going on and forge around that. I want to make sure at this point that my reins are pretty much straight to each other. And one of the easy ways to do that is use the ammo face. We're in a convenient spot here. Look, go down it, and look, not the ammo face, use the side of the ammo. I can look down it and I can see an air gap. So I'm going to go ahead and give myself a tap on that air gap. Check my other one. And I'm pretty much coming together. We'll fit these. We'll go ahead and put them up to this cake ship. Pop it tones are a hard one because they're gonna they're gonna do everything, right? They're not just gonna be for one shoot. So they're not gonna be for one stock size really. So I just I end up resetting a lot. So using my hot fit tone, I'll go to 516 since I nail on a lot of 38s. By the time I come back, I got a 516 shoot, and I at least with my hot fit tone still grab it. So that's actually a pretty good size to, to fit things up to. I'm gonna make sure I get that stock. All the way to the back of that jaw. If not, I'm going to have a little hanger in here. So I want to be equal, close from each side. Get it all on that stock, so then I can make sure I get the tip. And now once I'm there, I can close it. And it's just a matter of closing where you think your hand needs to be. So where you comfortable, are comfortable holding on to your tom, that's kind of different for everybody. You know, like, if you get a pair of toms, when you buy a pair from, from poor, from blue, you know, they're set to a general thing. They aren't set to a person. So it's like, a big guy's going to want a little bit more of a hand grip. A smaller guy's going to want a little bit tighter of a hand grip. So don't be afraid to heat things up and get things where you really want them. Fit up pretty good almost. And I have my lock, my lock, right? And so that lock works by friction and pushing against it. And so I want to come down with my hammer and kind of get a little bit of a bow in that ring to where it's going to push against that one and come down this one and get a little bit of a bow in that ring so it's pushing against that one. Make sure that all the tabs point at each other. At this point, I'm pretty happy with everything. So I'm going to go ahead and just brush things up and call. Remember, it's all going to tie it up again when you get cool. You got to keep things free. All we're going to do is brush that in. We're good for time. Anybody know? We got 30 minutes left, but not a lot. Huh? All right, we're going to do this part pretty quick then. I wanted to make a draft shoe. Not even, don't think of this as a demo on how to make a draft shoe, right? I, I want it to be kind of a demo just on how to use blue and metal towards shoeing horses and how to make horse shoes. So we just went through and made a pair of tongs that are pretty much a blacksmithy thing. Like, we as fairies should probably be doing a little bit more of it. I think it, we kind of lost ourselves in a little bit of that sense. It's around somewhat, but like I, I think guys should be making their own 
bunch of some bridges and stuff and know how to put up their own homes. But it's not what we make our bread, you know, on. So we need to know how to move it into shooting horses so it's actually a worthwhile event. Everything that we did in these is pretty much the same thing on our shoe. Metal is metal, and it's going to be that way every single time. So when you're doing something real big, like shoot, like making draft horses, man, it is definitely a time to use inertia and mass to your advantage. That's If you ever get a chance, Alice Johnson has his videos on Edward Martin, and I really think Edward Martin was really good at moving metal. You watch him make three heat draft shoots with bag heels really quickly because he was very efficient. And he just knew where to hit. He didn't waste a lot of time with trying to run things over and over and over again. He's just getting through it and hit spots where you had a lot of air gap and you were really fighting against yourself and forging a lot. He's just preventative and everything. Where we see it a lot now, I think that we got a lot of weird moves. And we get caught up in just making a shoe and we forget that we're also hitting metal. So you watch guys when they pump, and they're consistently holding on to the same part. They always got this face and that, and they're always just keep hitting here. They'll spot it out and come right back to it. Where you gotta think, the hammer's doing things to it. So if I do four hits here, and it pulls this at me, and that part away from me, well now if I straighten it out a little bit, I flip it, it's gonna straighten itself. So why not go ahead and handle things to where it's just taking care of itself, and I'm not fighting like, all the way through the gut. So if I can bump here, spin, bump here, flip over, and now come from the other side, now I have an even bump. And I'm sure if you guys actually measure your bumps, a lot of times, I know I do, it's like, I got more on one half than I do on the other half, because steel's coming to the hammer, so it's packing up on the closer aspect of it. And everybody kind of wants to go to whipping at it a little bit, and I'm sure you've heard the thing of sweep through it, swing all the way to the bottom of it, get it down in there, and that's just the fact that and something I learned from running power hammers is that if you ran a little power hammer, it flashes everything. You get a lot of mushroom. You run a big power hammer, everything comes out from the center. So if I can act a little bit more like a big power hammer and have a lot of drive through, I can get it more into my bump and not just clear out my ends. So I got a heat. Pretty good yellow soaking heat. And really that yellow isn't a great time to bump. It's just like an establishing time where you're kind of directing the metal where you want it to go. So I don't want to be too aggressive with it at that point at all. But I do want to get good cool lines. I don't want to have that heat lingering up that branch too much because then it's going to blend too much there. And really what I'm trying to do is make a shell for my bowl. Because I know I come by there. I'm going to come by here. I'm going to come from the other side. Now I can't just hit it with my regular swing. Because if I was going to go up regular swing at it, I'm going to be dipping it down here. Is this thing going to bring it more to me? So I'm going to get my elbow level with that thing. So then I'm getting it trying to get straight. So I'm really concentrating on that far corner. Again, I'm just attacking my mountaintops. I'm not going to go out to the valley and try to push them up. It's just a waste of time because it's against me. Alright, get a bend. And when you're bending, you got to think of the same thing. So your hammer is going to go down real easy, right? So you want to be preventive about it and kind of come in a little bit because you know you just have a bad habit as a human go straight down. And what that's gonna do is like true a lot, you know you come out your toe bend, you get it kind of laid up there, and here's your center bar, this side's under, this side's still sticking out. Well it's because you're hammering into this corner too much.
about a pair of op-ed talks that actually happened. I'm going to get a good air gap. By calling the toy point out, if I do this, I'm losing. And it's just a hard thing to fight. Then you want to push into your tongs, back into it. Ah, suck it up. Push down those big bumps, the bolt drums, so that heel's going to come back up into the inertia. And I know I'll set this up for a front. Now it's kind of pointy for a front, but I know when I go to bend my branch, it's going to push out. So I, I really don't want to be in a position where I start back again, where I have to come back and straighten things out. So a couple points, just give me a mark. And so even when I use an Andrew again, I know I've got to be preventative of where the hammer going to come from. So if I was holding it by myself, I know I'm going to have to pull it this way. So he's doing it for me, I know it's going to go that way. And so I want to kind of account for that when I put my line down. Being nice to a striker means that you're not going to make him chase your tools everywhere. So I really try to keep the tool in one spot. And not make them chase it all the way around the anvil wherever the heck I'm going. So I got a line established. We'll go ahead and throw some heels on here. The reason I wanted to do a draft tour shoot mostly because what we did in the shoulders of the tongs is an accurate. It's the same, it's the same thing. It's a total off the anvil blow to create a shoulder, and then you're gonna come back to from behind it. But I think it's a, it's a good comparison of where blacksmithing really falls into our work all the time. Thank you. 
you don't, you don't really know where anything is anyway, so you're just kind of freestyling. After that, we'll probably have a little liquor, huh? 12 minutes? Yeah, good. <laughs> good. Fort Main, but. Got 12. I'll, put a, I'll put another heel on this one too, kind of show you guys that when I go to a medial heel, I'm going to crawl up onto the angle face a little bit more because it's going to be a little bit of a more shallower, steeper. A little bit more shallower, steeper. It's going to be more upright because every time you go over to look at a shoe, it's, that's the straighter the branches before it doesn't come out and around. And so it can be a little bit more of an upright check. Where that one needs to be a little more out like this in the lateral because that's what the dog wants. So again, I'm going to run it up. Now I'm running up, this is the medial, so I get that game the horse, too. Takes it over. And I'm coming a little bit on the angle face now. My edges. But it is. Now I'm just breaking the first I'm just kind of getting things moving in the right direction. You need to tell this in, so you're actually dressing up that way. You can stick it up. So I can come in and have Aiden hit it for me, and I can shoot. That whole time I was staying at the bottom of it, because I wanted to kind of preserve it, and I'm not really wanting to work against myself. It's not until here that I'm kind of getting up the very bottom of it. You right here is sick. This would be a bad time to go for it, right? So I'm not going to just crucify this bowler if this is a new bowler. This would be a time that you would go ahead, hop in a slow go of the house, and break your tools in. Make sure everything's running right. Get things slipped up. And it even kind of can apply if you go and make, like go and clean your, your bowler up, you put all the little grind lines in it, it's a little sticky again. Everything's a little sharp. And I think that's one of the misconceptions of a bowler half the time, is guys get them really sharp. It's not a cutting. It's a bowler. And so it needs to kind of push things out of the way. There's moments where, like, there again, rules need to be broken, and you need a sharp bowler because it doesn't need to displace a lot of material, and you're just trying to get down. Well, that's not, that's a different beast right there. That's more of a splitter, a cutter. But an actual bowler needs to be a little round at the bottom, so it's just pushing things out, and it's got a nice bottom, it's not cutting or separating material out, which in return to kind of weaken it. But when you're bowling things, they tend to get stronger. That's why they fold old swords and stuff, is you kind of got a little bit out of there, but you got rigidity to it. This is a good heat for a new bowler, right? It's a nice hot heat. The metal it's working in is a lot softer than it. And I just want to keep it cool. It's that fast. Fight comes out a little bit here. I think this right here, this is still an okay heat to punch a new punch. But I think with a new punch, you don't want to just go ahead and send it. Just keep that thing really up and pulled off, or at least giving it a break out of, out of the metal. So 
So I just want a one hitter to get things out. It's amazing how much is going to cool down that little bit of time. But that's when bad things happen on about that third hit on a new punch. You got it in there, the first couple are right, but it's still in there. Now it's just getting hotter and hotter. And on that third one, it's closer to the angle face, so it's getting more recussion. And it's uh, probably going to get stuck in there or bend over on you. I used to think stuff like that was bad. You know, like putting on the air this and touching it up. I think it can be bad if you ride on it a lot. But man, if it's, if it's an easier hit, save yourself. Why go to the horn just to look like you know you're a real you know, or a real or something? Man, if you can get it down that the handle face and get it closed up in a hurry, you might as well go for it. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. This is a decent temp temperature in a Pritchelet, I think. I don't like Pritchelet at a real black heat. I think we kind of already made the boat on it at that time. I don't like Pritchelet at a real hot heat, because then everything's going to drag out. Just put a clip on here. Now, if I was going to clip this by myself, I'd have to be conscious that I'm coming into myself. Since I'm going to have Andrew clipping for me and hit my seat by seat. Come Andrew for me, I'm going to be conscious that it's going to pull things away. So I need to be a little bit more conservative when I'm hanging stuff over the ankle ledge. If I was going to do it for myself, I'd hang a little bit more because I know I'm going to end up pulling on my tongue and I know my hammer's going to drive and shoot back a little bit to me. But I know if he's going to hit it, he's going to pull everything forward, so I'm going to be a little bit cautious of it. And I want to be, I don't want to make hits hard for him. So even though that's really effective sometimes, I'm not going to make him start out there. I'm going to let us push that thing down and the last couple of blows come into it. So he's not having to come into it the whole entire time. And the same thing when we set the tongs off, the jaws up, I don't want to come out and just fight to fight. Because then I'm not going to get a good edge on it. It's going to kind of pull, pull everything over. But if I come up with my hand picked up a little bit and I get that edge dug in there and then start dropping my hand as he's hitting it, well everything will come to flat and I'm just going to pull everything and be rounded on the back side. Get 
wasn't real smooth driving, but really good in the point here. That's, I, that's what I kind of think of when you touch that circle too. Is it all comes back to those half face blows, hitting the mountaintops and off the valleys, and being conscious of how many times you hit each side. And I think if you kind of do that, you're going to be light years ahead because you're not fixing your own screw ups. Or the skill, building the skill set is hard enough and just learning the process of things. So if we can have good basics, things will fail a lot faster. All right, thank you guys.